Hello, everyone. Welcome to Scholars Hub at Home. My name is Evan Goldenthal, and I'm an alumni engagement officer at York University. Thanks so much for joining us for today's lecture, How Do Children Remember? Insights from Research about Memory and Brain Development with the new Jenny Pathman, Associate Professor in the Department of Psychology. I accept the responsibility to acknowledge the land that I am on. And because we're not all gathered in the same place, the land I'm about to acknowledge might not be for the territory that you are on. Please take the responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory that you are on. The website native-land.ca is a good resource for this. As a member of the York University community, I recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Tuckeronto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inui, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. The territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. And before we introduce our speaker today, I'm excited to tell you that York University is honored to be recognized among the world's top 40 universities in the 2023 Times Higher Education Impact Rankings for our commitment towards advancing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And we'd also like to conduct a quick poll before this session. The question is, how would you rate your knowledge regarding the topic of today's presentation? And the poll should pop up on your screen right now, and I'll just give everyone a moment to respond. Great, thanks so much. It's helpful for our speakers to know more about who is in our audience. And if you need help with Zoom webinar, feel free to click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and enter your question. Our team is here and ready to help you. That same button may be used to submit questions for our guest speaker to answer during the Q&A period following today's presentation. And please do note that all of your questions and comments are visible to our panelists and our staff working behind the scenes. So we ask that you keep your comments relevant and respectful. And I'd now like to introduce our guest speaker, Professor Thanujani Pathman. Thanujani Pathman completed her undergraduate work at McMaster University. She received her PhD from the psychology department at Emory University. She then completed postdoctoral training at the Center for Mind and Brain at the University of California, Davis. She was a faculty member at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro before moving to York University, where she is now an associate professor in the Department of Psychology. Her research interests are in cognitive development and developmental cognitive neuroscience. We are so pleased that you can make the time to join us today. Welcome, Professor Pathman. Thanks so much for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here. Thanks for coming. So please share your screen and I'll be back after the presentation uh, for the Q&A. Thanks. Okay, great. Okay, so again, I'm really excited to, to, to be here and, and um, discuss all of this with, with you all. So um, I'd like to start by just a little background. So I study uh, memory through the lens of developmental cognitive neuroscience. And developmental cognitive neuroscience is an interdisciplinary scientific field. Um, it involves cognition, so study of mental processes, so thinking, knowing, um, remembering. Um, it also involves neuroscience and neuropsychology, so the study of the brain, um, and also development, so change over time. So developmental cognitive neuroscientists are interested in how these um, cognitive capacities um, change across time from infancy to childhood to adolescence, and even in, in, into adulthood, um, and on the other end of, of the lifespan in older age. So one of my favorite slides to put up when I'm talking about development of cognitive neuroscience is this one. This is um, um, from a study from a paper by Gilbert Gottlieb. Um, and what I want to note is the different levels that are involved in, in an individual's development. There are many, many bi-directional arrows here. So 
basically there are multiple contributors to change. And similarly, there are multiple contributors to learning and memory in various interactions. Um, and this was highlighted in a special issue for the journal Developmental Cognitive Neuroscience, in this case, as it relates to education um, in, child, in children and youth. And I'll read the quote here. So understanding the brain mechanisms that underlie learning and memory and the effects of age, genetics, the environment, emotion, and motivation on learning could transform educational strategies and enable us to design programs that optimize learning for people of all ages and of all needs. So um, that is that that quote, um, and the research in our lab focuses on some of these bolded aspects from the quote, and I'll give you some background as well as we go. So in our lab, um, we study long-term memory. So long-term memory involves semantic memory, so learned facts and knowledge that requires extensive study. Long-term memory also involves episodic memory. So this is memory for past events from a particular time and place. Um, and this is what we typically think of when we think back um, about our memories. Um, we know that episodic memory is, is very important. Um, and here are some examples. So it's a vital capacity necessary for our daily functioning. So here are some ways that we as adults, but then also for children and youth, how we depend on episodic memory. So first, it's important for mentalizing alternative scenarios to anticipate future situations. For example, if, um, if you have a memory of burning your hand um, on the stove, or what I do constantly is burning my arm when I bring out a tray of cookies from the oven, um, the next time I'm doing this, I might remember that memory and try to be a little bit more careful. Um, it's also important for reminiscing about our past, right? And we, because we use it to build our life story. These memories make us who we are. We also know um, in terms of its importance, we know that we're, we're learning more about how episodic memory is related to um, various psychiatric and neurological disorders. Um, one example is schizophrenia. So there's a paper that was out that shows that this is a disorder where there's evidence of memory deficits that precede the onset and diagnosis and can predict the severity of some cognitive um, symptoms after diagnosis. We also know that episodic memories were vital for education. So for example, measures of episodic components of memory captures individual differences in reading comprehension. Um, further episodic memory allows students to remember the events um, that happened inside or outside the classroom and it's relevant for their learning. So for example, a child might say, oh, I remember that in Ms. Carter's science class, we learned about different states of matter. At the front of the class, there were two bins, one with water, one with ice, and she let us touch the ice and it was really cold. So that child has a memory, an episodic memory of that experience and that can impact um, the, her, her education, her learning. <clears throat> this type of learning also happens outside the classroom. So in museums, zoos, and science centers, indeed these non-traditional environments, these non-traditional learning centers, that's the whole point, right? So they're trying to make episodic memories for children and visitors uh, that are memorable and can impact curiosity and excitement about learning. Last, episodic memory is important for in forensic settings. So every year in Canada and around the world, tens and thousands, uh, tens of thousands of children um, are asked to report about past events with police interviewers and other legal practitioners. So eyewitness testimony is, is um, dependent on episodic memory, memory for past events from a particular time and place. So given the importance in all of these different areas, um, it's important to understand how episodic memory unfolds. So how does it develop? There are rapid and consistent changes that are occurring, and, and if there are um, you know, parents uh, in the audience or those that work with children, you probably have, have noted this. So a lot of attention has been paid to the emergence of memory for um, events um, early in development, and it's surprising, but historically it had been thought that infants couldn't really remember, um, but we know now that this is not the case. And over the first two years of life, there are drastic um, changes in how long infants can remember events and how much they can recall. But even in um, late childhood, there's age-related change. 
So this graph that I'm showing um, was part of an NIH study of about 400 um, children. They were given various neuropsychological assessments, including the California Verbal Learning Test. So this is um, uh, a free recall measure. So um, you know, given, given children a list of words and then take the words away and then ask them to remember or recall each of the words on the list. And so what I want to note is just the, what the development is like. So with six to you know, 12 along the, uh, on the, along the x-axis, you can see that there are a, a lot of change that is happening in terms of improvement in memory. So we can see that this trajectory is still um, very steep, even in late childhood. So the research goal for myself and my students in the lab is why? Why do we see so much development? And what are the underlying factors that can drive as driving this development? The goal in the lab is to examine the underlying factors that drive the development of episodic memory, but we all know, but we know that episodic memory is not one thing. Um, it's a complex construct um, and it's an emergent property of several factors. So these are some of the distinctions that we focus on in the lab. So episodic memory involves remembering an event along with its spatial and temporal context. So temporal context when the event happened and spatial context remembering where the event happened. All of this um, necessitates various mnemonic processes and all are influenced by brain development. In order to examine the different factors that influence episodic memory development, um, our lab, we use different measures. So we can um, observe behavior in infants and young children. So, um, for example, we can use imitation-based paradigms. So my um, PhD was with Patricia Bauer, and so I did a lot of this work with her as well at Emory University. Um, so for example, we can give um, infants different objects or props, and as an experimenter, we would model different actions that we can do with them. And then after certain delays, we can give the infants those um, props back and see if they um, imitate the actions that the experimenter did and imitate the order that the actions um, of, of the actions. And so this way, in this way, we can assess in a nonverbal way what um, infants um, and um, young like children are, are remembering. With older children, we can ask them questions. So we can ask questions directly. Um, some ways that we've done this is by having, asking ch children to watch pictures of, on a computer screen or participate in staged events and then um, asking them about those events. We can also study autobiographical memory, so memory that's more personally meaningful. Um, so out, not, not events that happened in the lab, but out in the real world. So there, we can ask children directly about um, everyday um, um, events that have occurred, and we could code what the child say says, their narratives for the details. So we can look at, okay, what types of details, the who, when, what, where details, um, how many details are they providing, um, et cetera, and how that changes as the children get older. And the last, the bottom pictures are, um, with photo taking. So another way that we've done this in the lab is by giving children cameras to um, use at a museum or zoo um, or to take them home. And they would, they children choose the events that they're photographing and then we can ask um, about those events later. So we can test memory overtly. We also combine it with different cognitive neuroscience measures. So we can record eye movements as, as children are viewing um, events on a computer screen. We can also have in the lab children participating in memory tests and then assess their the neural activity uh, by like we can record brain waves with uh, with these um, ERP caps. And we can also image the brain. So um, have children um, go in the scanner and we can, we can um, see what's happening structurally as children age in terms of um, brain development and also functionally what's happening as they're doing different memory tasks. And I'll highlight that today. So I'm gonna highlight two studies um, briefly here. So one is a lab-based study where we looked at the structure of the brain and how that's related to brain development. And then I'll highlight briefly a more recent naturalistic study where children went out, uh, were out in the real world having events that um, they, they, that sort of everyday events. And then we test, um, tested their memory in a more naturalistic way.
Okay, so for this first study, um, we're going to focus on one factor, brain development. So there are brain, uh, major brain regions that are implicated in episodic memory, um, and two of those are um, the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. In terms of what's happening across um, development and what the source of age-related change is, um, a lot of attention has been paid historically to the prefrontal cortex. Um, it had been seen as like a real driver in, in, the, in why there are so many improvements in episodic memory during middle childhood and beyond, and, and that is the case. Um, and this hypothesis is consistent with evidence that there are changes in the prefrontal cortex um, in terms of cortical thickness, for example, uh, even in adolescence and, um, and adulthood. So it's possible that these changes are related to episodic memory um, in cross-sectional samples as well. Studies have shown that. What we wanted to do was also look at the hippocampus as a contributor to change in middle to late childhood. So the study that I'll um, discuss now is with eight to 11 year olds and young adults. So we wanted to look at their behavior. So we had them perform an episodic memory task. We, um, they were in the scanner as well so that we were able to get a uh, snapshot of what their brain structure is like. Um, in this case, the, the volume of this region called the hippocampus. Um, and we also could look at brain behavior relations. So how in differences in what's happening in the brain um, could be related to memory performance. So um, previous studies might have underestimated the change that's happening in this region in the hippocampus because they were looking at the hippocampus as a whole. Um, and so what we did here is look at subregions based on these um, anatomical landmarks and to see if that could, could show or reveal um, any differences that might be happening. Maybe they were that, that, that would be more sensitive um, to age-related differences because in other studies, they have found heterogeneity along the longitudinal axis of the hippocampus. So for the study that I'll say, I'll give you a brief um, summary. There was an encoding phase, meaning what children studied, children and adults studied. Um, and then there was a retrieval phase, which is kind of, which is what was the memory test. So I'll go through here um, the example. So in this task at the encoding or during the study phase, they were asked to remember, or um, they were shown um, um, pictures like these cartoon line drawings of pictures like the swan you can see, and the pictures were shown with a particular background color. So the swan was presented with the yellow background color and other items were presented with different colors. And so at test, um, what we did was we showed the picture and this time they had to say whether it was old or new and, and and if it was old, which color it was, um, this image was shown with. So it's a really challenging task, but it's, they have to bind that event with that background color. We also did a version of the task where instead of color, it was about spatial location. So images like the cat were shown either on the left side or the right side of the screen. And at test, they had to tell us whether each image was on the left or the right. So really challenging task. Here is um, accuracy. So we can see that if we compare each to 11 year olds and young adults, that there is um, um, improvement. So um, consistent with other studies, there were memory differences in middle to late childhood. So what about the structure of the hippocampus? So we, like I said, um, wanted to look at re subregions of um, the hippocampus. So you can hear, you can see the structure here. So here's the head. Um, the body and the tail. And what we did was we um, marked them um, for each child and adult in the study. Um, and then we wanted to see if there were patterns that we're seeing as a group for each age group um, in terms of what's happening with the subregions volume. And we found differences. So even in, um, in late childhood, we're seeing that there are differences between children and adults in this, um, the subregions. In addition, we wanted to see if there were if these kind of changes or um, differences were meaningful. So I'm not going to go into details, but we found relations um, between the volume of the subregions and our measure of episodic memory. 
So um, this was uh, just an example of how there are physical changes that are happening in the hippocampus um, late into childhood. And these physical changes have implications, real effects for episodic memory development. Um, and I'll just say that there's a lot of great research from different labs around the world um, showing this like protracted development of the hippocampus. Um, and so it's not just the prefrontal cortex, it's also the, the hippocampus and other regions that are um, changing later than initially thought. Okay. So in the next study, I just want to highlight um, something with, does, that doesn't involve um, the brain, but what we wanted to look at is more as naturalistic events. So I highlighted this lab-based study um, at, um, with, the, with the MRI. Now we're switching to this. Um, in the lab, we use different types of events um, to test um, memory in children and adults. Um, and it's really important because, you know, they can, lab-based studies can tell us and help us look at kind of mechanisms and things like that, or where we can manipulate lots of different conditions to see what's happening um, in the brain. But these like pictures on a computer screen might not really um, be always the most appropriate way to test um, children's memory. So in some of our studies, we go out into naturalistic settings, um, and this is an example of that. So some of our studies involve going to informal learning environments like zoos and museums um, because that is um, sort of an, um, a place where we can kind of observe learning and memory um, in action that's happening. So this next study um, was recently published, um, and here's a photo um, of my, the team, the data collection team um, at the Toronto Zoo. Um, and you can see a friend, of, a zoo friend in the background as well in this picture. So let me give you um, a little bit of background. So here we wanted to look at something called memory search. So decades of foundational research using lab-based free recall paradigms um, show some fundamental mechanisms or, or properties of um, memory in adults. So, um, you know, if adults are given a, a list of words and then the words are taken away and then we're asked to recall as many words as possible. Um, and, you know, that would be an example of a free recall task. Um, and what researchers have done is looked at the order in which the individual words are recalled, and we they see a, like a reliable pattern called um, temporal contiguity um, that underlies how adults search and retrieve from our episodic memory system. So we're likely re to recall in succession items that were experienced closer in time. And so in this study, what we wanted to look at is the development of temporal clustering, this is what's been being sometimes called a universal property of memory systems. We wanted to see the development of this and whether we're seeing evidence of this effect in um, children, and also whether this occurs in naturally occurring uh, real world situations. So in this study, there were children um, from three age groups, four to five, six to seven, and eight to 10 year olds. And they took part in a five day summer camp at the Toronto Zoo. Um, and each day of camp, um, I mean, they had a lot of fun. Um, children took part in various dynamic events, including arts and crafts, musical activities. And what's important for our purposes is that each day also involved visits to unique animal exhibits. So the zoo um, provided us with each individual, individual child's um, camp schedule prior to testing that included information about which exhibits in the zoo children would, would exhibit each day and when. And so, um, and then on day five, they were interviewed by us and asked to recall all the animals they visited. So, you know, you took so many, you saw so many cool animals this week, but I wasn't there. Can you tell me um, all the animals you saw? So it's a free recall paradigm, but using events experienced over a much longer time than typical lab studies. Okay, so I'm going to kind of get to the punchline um, for time, but I can always go back and ask um, if you have any questions, uh, answer any questions that you have. So we looked at the number of animals that children recalled, and we found that um, this what age-related improvement. So four to five-year-olds didn't recall as many um, animals as six to seven-year-olds compared to eight to 10-year-olds. So all three age groups were different from each other. Um, 
And in terms of temporal clustering, I'm going to get to the punchline, but I can go back um, and answer questions if there are any questions. But um, we looked at, we use their schedules to look at whether children are also exhibiting this universal kind of sophisticated um, um, effect with how they were um, searching their memories to be, to be able to recall all the animals um, that they saw. Um, and we found that eight to 10 year olds were showing evidence of this um, clustering effect. Six to seven year olds were also showing the effect. Um, and so were four to five year olds. So what I'm showing in this graph is um, the dashed line, the vertical line here. That's what each age group was doing in terms of showing this temporal clustering effect. The, the, this line here and this um, histogram is showing what chance would be. So for all three age groups, they were showing um, this effect more than would be expected by chance. So children as young as four are showing this adult-like clustering effect, um, but even so, uh, which we were actually really surprised by that, um, but even, even though children are showing this in this naturalistic environment, um, which is really cool as well, um, there was still age-related improvement. So older children were showing this effect more than the younger children. So in terms of current and future directions in our lab, we're studying a lot of different things, um, including um, episodic memory, memory for time and space, um, semantic memory and language and how that could influence episodic memory. Um, and we're hoping to do more naturalistic studies, classroom studies. And what I'd love to be able to do is longitudinal study to see like how memory is really changing, not just in early or late childhood, but even um, across um, the lifespan. We are also having, we have some current studies ongoing as well. And I just wanted to mention that briefly. So we have a study with seven to 12 year olds and an, an upcoming study that's gonna be with four to 14 year olds and families can participate from home for these studies and receive a gift card. So if there are, I can, um, I just wanted to leave my, the lab website um, and you parents can go to this for parents page in order to kind of learn more and I'm happy to answer any questions about that. I'd like to thank past and current members, um, collaborators as well. So some of this work was with collaborators at UC Davis, Simona Getty, um, and um, at Vanderbilt, which is Sean Pollan. I'd like to thank my current graduate students and undergraduate student RAs, the participants who generously gave their time, and the Toronto Zoo for, for that last study. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, for that informative and fascinating talk. So as mentioned, we do have time for questions now. So please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask those questions. And for those of you who are watching live on Facebook, uh, you're welcome to submit any questions or comments through the comment section for the video. So we had our first question come in, and it is, has there been any research in memory before birth? Uh, and then there's a comment, I'm not surprised that event memory emerges in infancy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. Yeah, so there have been some studies looking at, um, so there's been studies, for example, where when the child is in, um, in the like womb, like um, stories were read or different kinds of music played. And then after birth, whether um, there was memory for that. And there is some indication that there that there is, um, but it's 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 basic in terms of like maybe um, obviously not as um, in terms of how we can test it, but there is evidence that they're maybe remembering the intonation, that they're, they're showing familiarity for those, those materials. Um, we also know, for example, that there, there must be um, in terms of um, being able to recognize um, like, you know, the voices um, and things that they hear um, in the room um, as well. So, so there is a lot of really um, interesting, interesting work related to that. Great question. Fascinating. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, why do my children seem to remember some things really well and remember other things terribly? <laughs> yes. So yes, I have young children and I've experienced that too. And sometimes it can be um, frustrating. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different factors. I mean, part of, 
because memory is so complicated and in terms of the memory process as well, um, it might be that children didn't encode it in the first place. So if their attention was somewhere else, um, they, they might not have encoded it. And then the other aspect is not the encoding or the taking in the information, but bringing it out um, in terms of having the right retrieval cue. So the memory might be in there, but maybe there wasn't, in a, a, there isn't the right cue to be able to remind, like be able to kind of bring out that memory. It's related to that memory search um, study that I did before. Um, and so we know that children are really, um, um, you know, individ they're individuals, right? Even at a very young age. And so what one particular child might be interested in might not be what another child is interested in. And so their attention and focus would be, would be quite different. Um, and so I've done studies in the past, for example, where we gave children cameras and this one was happened to be at a, at a natural history museum. And we said, you know, take pictures of whatever you want to in this um, exhibit. Um, and then we can test their memory using the child's individual photo. So we're not telling them what they need to remember they're choosing. And when you look at the photos, it's really interesting. Like some children would focus on like, you know, this one, the foot of, <laughs> of a dinosaur skeleton, right? Whereas other children will take other pictures. And by testing memory in the, in these, more individualized ways, maybe we can, it, it, if we don't do that, we might be underestimating what children remember, because I think as parents, we know that, again, they remember some things really well, maybe what they're really interested in or what they um, are focused on. Other things, if they're not so interested, um, if they weren't paying attention, um, or again, like that, not having that right retrieval cue, they might not remember. But even as a researcher, like I rely on my kids to tell me, like, okay, where, where was that? You know, and I'm, I'm surprised all the time of the different things that they remember, um, you know, months and, and, and years later. So there are definitely cases where I rely on their memory, <laughs> not mine. Yeah. Amazing. Um, so here's just another question and comment. So thank you very much for the presentation. Just wondering if these studies have been adjusted to take into account the impact of bilingualism on memory or false memory. Yeah, great question. So there isn't from so um, Ellen Bialystok um, at York University is a really um, like well known researcher and recently she and I have started to collaborate to kind of answer this question so we're interested in looking at how bilingualism language experience can impact memory. Um, there is some research out there, but it's not that much in terms of how like episodic memory and how bilingualism language experience might influence that. We know that bilingualism language experience ex um, influences um, like, you know, um, cognitive control and other executive function type um, attention, all of that. And so it seems like it would impact memory, but we don't um, know too much about that yet. So it is definitely something that um, I'm interested in that we're still starting to get those studies going. Yeah, great question. Great, uh, just see another one here. Um, how can we use this information from the study to help with curriculum development for teaching kids or in sports for coaching kids? Mm -hmm. Another great question. Um, so yeah, some of my um, students um, as well, actually, um, Lena Decker, who just defended her dis dissertation yesterday successfully, yay, um, her study was looking at that in terms of how we can use autobiographical memory to influence or improve um, new learning. So in her study, just to give it as an example, um, we had um, like they were asked to, the participants had to learn new information in one study, just new words and another one facts. And we wanted to see whether associating past memories to the facts or the to, the to be learned information could in, um, improve memory for those um, that information. And we found that it did. So we found that relating um, a memory to what they're supposed to learn um, can, could influence and boost that memory. We also found in some cases, depending, that um, making up a fictional story related to what they're supposed to learn, those facts, could also boost. And in some cases, when it was facts, it was easier to associate to, with this fictional story that they made up than a memory. So that helped boost. So that's just one example of how we can kind of use some of the research that we're doing to impact um, classrooms. Because that's, I mean, that's the goal. Like we're doing basic research, but we're hoping that some of this work has these societal kind of impacts as well. Um, 
So yeah, I hope that answered your question as an example. Amazing. Another question here, would the studies you cited support evidence for experiential learning opportunities? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I'm a big fan of experiential um, learning, um, especially with the role of the self. So some of the studies that we have done in the past is showing that when um, there is self-relevance to what you're learning, um, that that's going to boost memory. Um, I mean, we can all understand that, um, I think, in, in, um, in, on, you know, anecdotally as well. And so having that experiential learning um, um, Give, allows more of those connections to be made. Um, and in, in addition, like just going out in, into the like the real world, being able to make those connections, having lots of different types of um, experiences that we can um, attach to those memories, that also improves memory as well. So um, just even in, in infancy or younger, like um, just going back to infant studies, um, you know, when a child is watching something happen versus actually doing it, memory is going to be better for those imitation type things that I mentioned before. Um, and so that's just going to kind of be amplified, continue um, as well. So for some of the studies, we do actually have um, the memory isn't just pictures, but events like actions and things like that, that children are doing. So yes, I, I think it, it, it does have an impact. <laughs> Great. Uh, so just can you explain a bit more about the overall purpose of your research? So like, will it be used in education, for example, to develop methods to help children improve their memory skills, or just to speak a bit more about that? Yeah, yeah, happy to do that. So, so yeah, the research that we do, um, well, I can talk about a few things. So the, a lot of the research we do um, is, is done so that we can kind of learn, describe what children are doing and what factors might be causing influence. And so those are published in, in scientific journals. So we're hoping that, you know, educators and, and other groups can look at that kind of evidence and kind of apply it to their research. But I am more recently kind of working more directly with those that apply the, the, the research um, in this study, so collaborating with different groups. Um, so for example, like, like partnering with the Toronto Zoo, like they're interested in learning about what children are, are remembering from their, um, from their kind of um, exhibits and all of that. Um, and I've done this with other trying informal like science centers and museums and things in the past as well. And then in addition, so I'm hoping that from in that way that it's it's related to education. Um, I have a graduate student now who's interested in a new study that would be done in schools, hopefully, um, that will have a direct um, um, impact of, of educational, like what we can do to improve um, their, their memory for that. Um, in addition, I have other studies where um, I'm partnering with um, those that work in legal and forensic settings. So, you know, that um, problem of like eyewitness testimony and whether children and how much children are being able to remember. And also the other side of like, are we um, giving credit, the, the credit that they deserve children? Um, and, and because sometimes um, it's possible that children's testimony might not be seen as, as as credible as adults. And I don't think that that necessarily should be the case, um, but we need some research to kind of show, okay, at what ages are children accurate for what type of information and all of that. And so I have a, um, a new grant with the collaborators who work with and train police interviewers and accept, um, and that type of thing that I'm really excited about. Uh, that's the study that I had mentioned with four to 14 year olds that we're gonna start. So I'm hoping that the research would have educational um, implications, but also implications for like, you know, courtrooms and forensic settings to be able to give legal practitioners kind of some information about, okay, yes, like we should believe what, what, what children are saying. Here's, here's proof that they're being accurate. Great. That's fascinating. Okay. Here's another question. So for children whose executive function and working memory is affected by, for example, ADHD, FASD, are there studies to indicate potential for improvement in memory, for example, through strategies or developmental tools? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. So I not I haven't done that work um, my myself directly um, with with those with those groups, but it's such important work that is coming out. So there are studies that are looking at different kinds of strategies um, for particular groups and how to improve. Um, and so, yeah, if, if, if anyone is interested, feel free to email me and I can search for some and send them to you as well. Again, it's not work that I've done, but but just other studies that, that exist. 
this. And I think it's just some an area that we just need more and more um, research um, to, to really kind of help. Um, yeah, but, but I'm happy to send some over. Great, thank you. And uh, you had a slide about this at the end, I believe, but just if you could uh, talk a bit more about how can families become more involved in future studies? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, the, um, you know, our research um, is dependent on families that volunteer their time. And so uh, we try to make it a really fun experience because it's, it's, it's helping um, science. And I think families really that participate in our studies really um, would like that because of the implications that the research can have to improve society. But then for the child um, themselves, it's like a fun experience and we make it more similar to a game, we make it age appropriate. Um, and often in our studies, um, children also get, um, our families get a gift card or a, and a junior scientist certificate with their name on it. So um, it's, it's a fun experience. Um, yeah. And so if you go to the website, there's um the that I mentioned so um maybe I'll put it in the chat as well but um it's the there's a parents page and so you can get information and uh, frequently asked questions because some studies do involve coming to your campus and our lab and some studies um they can be done remotely so all you need is a computer or a tablet um, and it can be done from home and scheduled at your convenience. Um, and yeah, so on that website, there's a sign up um, page to sign up for a database. And all that means is you're giving us your email address so that if we have a study um, relevant for your child's age, um, we'll email you and ask if you want to participate and tell you more about the study. And then, like I said, there are some ongoing studies there as well. So if you click on that, if you look at the Koala study is what we called it, um, and um, you can sign up there um, and learn more about that particular study. Great, thank you. And I believe this will be the last question. Uh, has the difference in memory of things seen on a screen versus memory of experiences been explored at all? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is the case that like on the screen versus um, in real life that there are, are differences that in if, if, if I understand your question right, like things that are learned on a screen might not be remembered as much um, as things where we're participating that it goes back to that um, having that experience. Um, but it is possible to learn from, from the screen. It's just that there's an increase. There's a boost when 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 the events are more engaging. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, so I believe that's it. So thanks again, Professor Pathman, so much for being with us today. And uh, you're welcome to turn off your video. So thanks again for such an informative and insightful talk. Thank thanks you. Thanks so much, thanks. And for those of you who would like to share today's session with family and friends, it will be posted to our YouTube page at youtube.com slash alumni. And you can also watch past lectures that you might've missed. We do have one more poll question for you, and it's how would you rate your knowledge of today's topic following this discussion? And it should pop up on your screen right now. And we do invite you to learn more about upcoming sessions at our website, yorku.ca slash alumni and friends. And Scholars Hub at Home will be back in September. So just enjoy your summer and we'll see all of you in the fall. Thanks again so much and be well. Bye-bye.